So welcome to this talk. I'm uh, Michael Obdenacker, the, um, uh, the founder of Bootlin and working as an embedded um, Linux engineer now. Um, Bootlin is a software uh, service company um, focusing on the low-level cool stuff about embedded Linux, like BSPs, uh, build systems. So I uh, always have, uh, what I like in this community is that al I'm always a, um, happy to, I always can learn from new projects. That's nice. So I, that's why I have this, this one. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, it's nice to, uh, to be in front of a real audience again. I see no cats, no people in pajamas, I think. <laughs> and um, well, the, the bad thing is that I don't, I don't have the ability to change t-shirts uh, between every slide to keep you uh, uh, focused. But you're all locked in with me, so no way to escape. <laughs> Good. Uh, by the way, about Butlin, we, uh, we have lots of uh, training materials that are freely available. I'm one of the authors of some of, some of those. I'm also the co-maintainer, the maintainer for the Yocto project documentation, so please send us patches. And also I maintain the uh, Elixir cross-referencer, not the language, but the, uh, the tool that you use to browse the Linux kernel, the U-boot sources, and um, all the other ones, uh, many ones like C and C++ projects. That's the abstract, uh, just to, like put people reading it uh, online. So, um, Actually, uh, this is not a very complex uh, product here. I'm just sharing the knowledge. Um, we have the opportunity to explore system update technologies to prepare slides for, um, and lab data for a customer project, a customer seminar. Um, and we wanted to uh, let participants practice with AB software updates uh, using the software update solution. And the theory was not so complicated to find, but it was a bit harder to find which uh, practical details you could you could use to fo you could follow on the U-boot side uh, more than on the Linux side, but like um, how how to implement that was like took a, a bit more research. Too, I'm happy to share that with you through this presentation. So here it's just like one of the cases we are talking about full um, image update um, approaches. So you want to when you uh, deploy an, an update to a, to a device, you want to uh, just reflash the device with a full, a full update of the system. Uh, this guarantees that what you uh, have on the device is fully tested um, and it's consistent, like you don't have like uh, file by the pile updates like as you would have in packages. Um, and of course, with this approach, you can't update the system while it's running. So that's why you need like two partitions, uh, two different partitions to boot on. Uh, you have like two cases, you have the AB scheme when you have two full copies of the, the root file system and you, have some, you switch between them, like one is active, one is inactive. And another way is to use a rescue system. So you have like a smaller root partition. Uh, you can boot on when you want to make a, to flash an update, right? Uh, and to flash the full, up, the full copy of the update. But you, you still alternate between those two. And that's, the, that's interesting you need some uh, bootloader integration to switch between systems. And I'm just sharing the, 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 tech, the practical details about those. So that the typical way you uh, apply the system update is to, you have the system that runs on, like say, uh, on um, active copy A. When you find an update, uh, either local update, like you plug in a USB key or something, or an SD card, or over the network, the update image will be flashed, written to uh, the copy B, the, the other partition that's uh, inactive so far. And if uh, flashing is successfully applied, then you need to update the bootloader configuration. So at reboot, the uh, the new uh, the new uh, update right is, uh, is 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 used is used by the bootloader right. And you you want to mark the, uh, the the updated copy as the active copy now. So the system will reboot on that active new active copy. Will try to Successfully boot. If it if it doesn't work, uh, then uh, you can use a watchdog to detect that and uh, reboot and fall back to um, an old copy, if the old copy if necessary. And that there are also a few tricks to know uh, how to detect the failed update. So the, the the main practical questions here that I had to solve is uh, how to identify how to identify the active partition. So uh, from U-boot first to boot on the right version of the system, so that right at boot time, 
but also from Linux when uh, an update is, me is meant to be deployed, uh, of course deployed in the right partition, not the uh, active one, of course, otherwise that would be an issue. Uh, and then another question was how to swap the active and act uh, inactive partition from Linux uh, right after an update. And also from U-Boot, when you fail to boot on the new update, you want to fall back to the previous one. So that has to be done on, on U-Boot. Right. And how to fall back to the original version too if the update fails to boot properly, uh, like how to detect that and how to fall back. Uh, so here we are going to address those questions in a generic way. I know there are um, bootloader integration solutions in the uh, generic tools that you can have, like software update, raw or bender, to do this. Here, um, that's that's a, um, like solution agnostic. It, it's like the bare metal uh, Linux, and, uh, bare Linux and bare U-boot. So how to switch between root file systems? So one of the techniques to, uh, to implement this is to uh, specify the active partition through, ad through adding a bootable flag uh, to that partition. That's, that's, what, that's supported by the partition tables to have boot flags. Uh, sometimes you use this to, uh, to make sure that the ROM code boots the right, finds the bootloader there. It depends on, the, uh, on, on your SOC. So um, this is typically done um, to, um, to find out which, which the active partition is uh, after, um, well, to, to toggle the, the, uh, the active partitions. So after an, uh, an update is applied successfully, uh, uh, on Linux you, you'll have like to do that if you detect that that was successful. Uh, so if you're using a GPT partition table, you can use the sgdisk uh, command right here, like, like here, right? Uh, that, um, that will, uh, assuming you have two, uh, one active partition and one uh, another one that's not active, it will toggle the partitions. Like it will uh, sta change the state of partition two and change the state of partition, uh, sorry, par partition four and partition five. Like it just switches the alternate between them. So once it's not no longer bootable and the, the new one get becomes bootable. If you have an um, MBR legacy uh, partition table, I just found a command to, uh, to make one partition uh, bootable, uh, like the parted command. Um, if so, uh, sorry, no, you can't use. Mm, well, there's a there's a mistake here because uh, yeah, it's talk, it's talking about. Ah, yes, there's here. Yeah, parted works. Sorry, parted works support both <laughs> supports both MBR and uh, NGPT. So with parted, you can actually turn on the, the bootable flag on one partition, and all the other ones would lose. They are bootable flags if they had one, right? Uh, you can't use the sgdisk, uh, SGDisk um, command here because it would convert your, uh, GP, your MBR partition to the GPT format. And then that could be an issue if your, boot, your ROM code doesn't support this kind of flag. It, if it just supports MBR, like the uh, OMAP SOCs, for example, the, at least the ones I know, like the, people, the one on the bigger movement black, uh, yeah, you won't be able to boot anymore because yeah, the, the ROM code won't recognize this flag, this partition type. And then um, be before you actu actually apply the update, you should also detect which is, from Linux, you should detect which is the current uh, partition that has the bootable flag. So this is a command you can use. If you use a GPT partition table, you use the HGTS command I'm proposing here. So, um, that's the uh, bit attribute two uh, of the partition. Uh, par partition four is in this example. So if it's set, you get zero, uh, one, and otherwise it's zero. And if you have an MBR partition table, you can use this small, this 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 small short command as well. Uh, that will return the number of the partition which is marked as bootable. So that's very simple practical details, but uh, I hope to save you the research. And then. Um, when you boot, reboot, right? Uh, U-boot should be able to detect which, to which one the, part the, the bootable partition is. So um, what I found is that you need to compile U-boot with the part list, uh, the, the part command. And, um, and then you can, using this uh, configuration flag, and then you can uh, run part list, MMC, uh, the, the MMC device you want to use, like MC0, which could be like the external S SD card. And that's bootable uh, in the name of a variable that will receive the uh, output that, you know, like which, 
which is the uh, partition with the bootable flag. So at the end, you get uh, the boot part variable that contains that information. And then you can use that in the subsequent scripts, right? That will that will boot correctly. So it would like look like this. Uh, the first solution, and then yeah. The, so you from this information, you can load the right kernel, you can load the right DTB, uh, but you also need to adjust the boot arcs to load to to boot on um, on that to root file system. And there's a nice trick in new boot that's called a config uh, boot arcs subst in case you don't know it. Uh, that allows to have a substitutable, su substitutable part in, um, in boot arcs. So here, what we're going to do is use this uh, boot part in a variable directly in our boot arc. So it will be uh, root equal dev mmc block zero p dot boot part. You could also make this up if you don't have this feature in your boot, just like sentence boot, ar boot, part, uh, boot arcs at run at boot time, set it to um, some st shared boot arcs plus the, the boot part definition that's also possible, but it's more straightforward. So I just didn't know about this possibility. I find it cool. And then you would set the boot command uh, like this. So part list, of course, to find uh, the bootable partition first. Load the kernel from the right partition. Load the DTP from the same the right partition, like the currently uh, enabled one, and you then you can boot, right? So pretty simple here. There's another um, technique you can use as well to um, to boot on the the right the the right partition with the right the corresponding boot arcs that you set the, the the kernel command line that you set for for the, the corresponding partition. You could you you could actually compile um, U-boot for support for the X Linux way that's used that's nice for distributions typically. So um, compile Linux uh, U-boot with uh, systemd um, so cmd says boot. And uh, this way, like the sysboot command, this way you boot can load the kernel, the DTB, uh, in FS if you have one, plus the kernel command line from a specification in a, in a file that's in the partition, that's the in, in the active partition, like xlinux.conf. And uh, this, this works on a lot only for local booting, like uh, USB MMC, but also through the network, like that's part of uh, like PXC boot and DHCP. So, um, it's nice because uh, with this access Linux option, you probably saw that, but not necessarily uh, without knowing what implemented it. It's uh, you've got a list, uh, a, boot, a list of uh, configurations to boot on, each one corresponding to uh, an xlinux.conf file. So that's nice. You, you could have a recovery option here if you want as well. So there's a bit of documentation in your boot about that. So here's what the configuration looks like when you're using xlinux. So you have a label that shows in the menu at boot time. You've got the uh, path to the image, the z image file, the compressed kernel, a path to the device tree. So that can be specific to that partition if you want. And then the uh, kernel command line as well. So this, this could also be specific to the, your partition or something generic like here that you build from your build system that never changes. And that just makes a reference to the boot part uh, variable that's uh, that you figured out before in your boot. So that's, yeah, same. that's a fixed content here uh, with a variable part. And this way, yeah, you can boot on the right stuff with the right arguments. So no need to tweak this, this file uh, from your build system, just build the same thing always. But though you could tweak it if you, if you really want it, you could tweak it. And then to make X Linux work, you need a, a, a a bunch of environment variables to be set as well because yeah it needs to know where to load the, the kernel where to load the DTB. so you have like kernel ad address in ram the ram disk address in ram if you're using an intram fs you've got the DTB address like the flat device tree no, the device tree the, the device tree binary there's the pxc address in ram uh, where you would load the configuration like the xlinux.conf file and boot file um, uh, that's the path to the configuration file that you can customize as well. So by default, it's a uh, slash boot uh, xlinux linux, xlinux .conf, but it could be something else. And then to, to make it work, you, well, typically you, I, I, at least in my experiment, I had to run part list uh, to find out the, boot, the currently active partition, right? And then run sysboot mmc, the, uh, the device, uh, the partition I want to use, the active partition, and any is a parameter that represents the file system you want to use. That's, that's part of 
this boy, they want you can specify x2, x4, maybe p5, I don't remember. Um, actually, this could be simpler than that. If you look at Hubert's documentation, it could be made. It could be made to automatically read xlinux.conf from the active bootable, uh, the current bootable, bootable flag. So it could actually look it up by itself, and then use that information um, to, um, to 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 load the right the, to load the, the the configuration file from the right partition. At least this didn't seem to work from a SAMI 5D3 explained uh, for microchip. Um, maybe I, there's always an issue between the keyboard and chair, uh, but yeah, uh, I had to go the, the more complex way and this just worked fine, but maybe it can even be shorter. Just uh, just mark a partition as uh, bootable and configure U-boot to use uh, xlinux and automatically picks up the right, the right partition, maybe. Not sure yet. Next question is how to recover from a failed update. So if you have uh, an AB partition scheme, uh, there are several cases. So when the update fails to apply, uh, that's easy to manage, that fails, so nothing to do. You detect that and you stick to the current root file system until you get a new update that would correct that. If that's successful, uh, the thing that you have to do is, uh, uh, of course, boot to the new one, but also confirm that the new root file system also works correctly and otherwise you fall back to the uh, older root partition. If you just have a single root file system and a rescue file system, if the update fails, uh, the system may not boot at all. So um, <laughs> you need to uh, uh, um, a mechanism in the bootloader to fall back to the rescue file system and wait for an, a new update. So the same mechanisms will apply. So uh, there's a nice mechanism that it I wasn't aware of in uh, U-Boot to uh, detect the failed boot attempts. So you enable this through uh, config boot count limit. And if this is on, then uh, after an update is applied, like from the script, from software update, whatever you do, um, you uh, should set the environment, you boot environment variables, like uh, upgrade, var um, upgrade available to one. So you do that from Linux and boot count uh, to zero. Uh, I'll show you how to do that from Linux. So when you boot starts, when you boot boots, it checks the value of upgrade available. If it's non-zero, then it will increase boot count and try to boot. And uh, well, except that if boot limit is uh, is defined as another variable, that's like the number of boots that you accept before considering that the uh, boot that the update will fail to boot. Uh, if it's greater than that limit, you boot will actually run commands that are defined in another boot sequence, like uh, not boot cmd. That's the default behavior. It will be boot uh, out boot CMD. So that's where uh, that's a sequence of commands you can run to fall back to the other partition. So uh, how does it work? Uh, when Linux booted successfully um, on the new file system, you can have a user space application taking care of resetting upgrade available to zero. So we consider that everything is fine and boot count back to zero, right? And then the next time you boot, there's nothing to do. Uh, you boot won't even count the, the booting. It's considered as, as fine. Otherwise, the system will be rebooted either manually because the users see there's a user there that sees that doesn't work or uh, using uh, or automatically if you have a watchdog to do that. And then boot count will increase over and over again after every boot until the boot limit is, is reached. Uh, by the way, so I told told you about boot limit. In, no, I'm sorry, um, boot count. Uh, by default, it's sh uh, saved in an, an, an environment variable, but it's also possible uh, that may be easier um, in uh, other non-volatile uh, sources, like on a, on an SQRC device. If you have a nice um, RTC, you could store that information in that RTC. That's what they they say in the U-boot configuration. In an EEPROM, in on a SPI flash. Uh, even on a file on the next two file system or X4. In RAM, if you have a, a area that's persistent, a uh, cross resets. So there's a bit of documentation in um, readme.bootcount in the you would doc documentation. I think I, I, con I remember I contributed to that, like to, uh, to explicit those things. So um, just some practical details here as well. Uh, how to update uh, 
the upgrade variable and boot count variable from Linux after applying an update to like make sure that the boot count mechanism is on, uh, or to disable it when the latest update booted successfully to completion. You can use actually some um, scripts or some commands that are provided by uBoot. It's called firmware printf and firmware setenv. That's, that's available in the uBoot source code. So you can compile either uh, them either manually, right? Or using your build system like Yocto or Bitroot. So Yocto, it's like the lib uBoot env recipe. And there's, an, uh, there's a particular option in Bitroot to do that as well. Um, yeah, so if, if you want to know more, you have like details on the documentation as well. And uh, just quick details in case you haven't never used a watchdog yet. Um, s what you would do is uh, you configure U-Boot to enable a watchdog on your platform at boot time. That's up to the bootloader to do that. And when Linux is booted, well, you don't forget to feed the dog. So um, regularly you, you write to slash dev slash watchdog and this, this proves that your system is still alive. Um, so run a regular process, a peri periodic process to do that. Or eventually, if you consider that you booted far enough, uh, just turn the watchdog off, and then you don't have to do that anymore. Otherwise, yeah, the hardware, the, if it's not fed, the watchdog will but get, get crazy, uh, re will reboot the machine, and the boot count will be increased. Uh, there's a reference to the uh, watchdog API in the kernel documentation for details. So it's essentially, you write to a character device. That's pretty easy to do. Now, um, after you make, you have an, an, excess, an unsuccessful boot, then you need to fall back to, to switch the uh, active and inactive partitions. So I'm giving you some, I found some commands in your boot to do that, to, to edit the partitions. So um, there's the MBR command in your boot, like that was new to me as well. Uh, it's, you find it in config uh, command MBR. And that MBR takes a, a command, takes a specification like, like those, like all the partitions you have. And one of the partitions can be um, given the uh, bootable flag here. And all the, all the other flags are like the type of partition. So that there was like fat, if I remember correctly. And then the other ones were Linux type, if you, if you remember those from FDisk. And then you uh, use the M MBR write, uh, MMC and number of MMC device. And th that will take the specification and write the, um, write the changes, right? commit the changes. And the last thing you can do is uh, run MBR, verify, to make sure that uh, the actual partition layout is in sync with the, um, the specification. Or you could do that first. Right? If it's not necessary to change, then don't, don't change it. Uh, for GPT partitions, you have similar commands. It's called the GPT write and GPT verify. So why did, you, did we use uh, partition flags, you may wonder? Um, so the first reason is that I that's what the distro boot functionality of uBoot is supposed to use uh, to rely on by default. So uh, that's why we, we chose that <laughs> initially. Uh, but another reason to, uh, even if you're not using uh, X, uh, distro boot, is that the environment, saving the environment is far from being atomic. Like the environment can be like 10 pages big or something like that. So you have like multiple storage blocks to shuffle, to modify. Uh, many things could go wrong, so it's better to have make, an, a, make a change that as small as possible, like just ch ch toggling a bit in the uh, partition table, if in, even if, of course, on MMC it implies rewriting one page, of course. Um, so, but you could, you could well find uh, another non volatile type of storage on your SOC or on your board to store such, such information. Um, so if you have any clues, let me know. <laughs> that would be interesting. So uh, some limitations about this approach, we're getting close to the end. Um, we have only uh, addressed the assistant that are booted from block devices, and that's the most common type today, it seems. If you're booting from NAND flash or NOR flash, you could store the partition. You could, uh, you, you could store the partition, the flash partition to use on a specific non-volatile storage somewhere, like on one of the flash sectors, if you want. Um, and um, I'm not sure. Uh, Another, another limitation of the approach here, I'm not sure whether U-Boot or even the Linux commands will provide you with uh, atomicity guarantees. So some things could be wrong uh, when you apply the update and you, if, if your 
uh, you lose the power during the update and think during the toggle, uh, you are not immune to, to issues here. So at least a good idea could be to use U-Boot's uh, redundant environment features. So if one of the two copies of the environment is corrupted, uh, U-Boot can still use the other one. So it's not only on, on um, flash storage, that is the most common, uh, that that's where it's commonly used, but you could also have it on block storage, have two copies of the environment, and U-Boot will fall back on the, will have a valid environment to boot from. Because here we're using a shared environment from the two, the two, the two, uh, uh, the two updates, the two versions of the file system use the same environment. Uh, and then the next question that we haven't addressed either is how to update the bootloader. So, um, yeah, you need to configure um, SPL, the SPL, the first stage bootloader, to load U-Boot from a file system so that each file system, like A and B, could have like different U-Boot. That would work fine. But anyway, it's going to be probably difficult to implement the partition selection and the boot counting uh, approach in the SPL because the um, space is limited and you may not have this feature in the SPL. So that's not trivial to implement. So may not be trivial. So um, if you're booting from MSC, you uh, one thing you could do is uh, flash the SPL and new boot on a special boot zero and boot one hardware partitions. Um, for example, on Bigable Black, you have those. Uh, the, you have an MMC with those. If you boot Linux on those and check slash proc slash partitions, you'll see that those exist. They are defined in hardware. You can't choose the tweak of those partitions, but they correspond to special parts in the MMC that are <coughs> correspond to more reliable storage and maybe faster as well. So that's good to put you boot an SPL on those. But um, if you, if you uh, so there's, a, there's actually a command that's uh, called MMC partconf in you boot. That's uh, you can follow that documentation link if you, if you want here. That tells you boot to uh, use that uh, boot zero or boot one, or, uh, or or just the regular uh, storage if you want. But so that you can specify after an update to say I want to boot on boot zero or I want to boot on on boot one. So that's possible, but um, you need to your SOC to support this mechanism, like finding uh, which one, uh, so like reading that information on the MMC, the MMC, which one is the active one. And this, I don't know, this this is probably highly uh, SOC specific, but you guys may have some some uh, insights about this, so I'll be much interested if you if you have some. And otherwise, uh, it's not advisable to update the SPL on the field, like keep it on a shared place and find a way to to jump to the correct partition from U-Boot SPL, but that's probably more challenging. So ultimately, uh, it's probably safer not to update the bootloader on the field and just do that when you get um, a product back to the lab and you, you can do that under supervision from from your, your engineers, your technicians, they, they can handle that, of course. So what to remember here, um, the, new, the main new things I learned about U-Boot here is that you have a partless command to find the boot part the, the the block the, the the block partition that has the bootable flag on SD, uh, on a SD card or on EMMC. You have MBR and GPT partitions to edit the partitions from your boot uh, on block devices, and uh, your boot indeed can keep track on of boot failures, and you can count the boot failures. So using the boot count environment variable, and in that case you can run an alternative boot sequence through the alt boot cmd um, variable when the maximum is exceeded, and that's the boot limit. So that's the most things to remember in case you were not aware uh, that those those commands existed in your boot. So thanks to my friend Slava <laughs> for helping me and giving you good insights, uh, reviewing the slides. Thanks again. <laughs> uh, for Thomas, to uh, Thomas Petazzoni for uh, the blog post he wrote on uh, applying using software update on SPM32 and P1, so that you can read that uh, and have a practical implementation of that. And my colleague uh, Corinne Mensant as well for sharing her experience uh, on on this kind on this topic. Right. Uh, so quick references here. There's a great presentation. Uh, if you're like uh, there, there has been various presentations on software update techniques at this conference. And there's another one good at another good one at ELC uh, in Austin last time from uh, Leon Henry from Consulco. So that there's a good 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 reference, good and exhaustive reference. 
and a few there's a few uh, bulletin blog, blog posts related to um, using the, the book mechanisms such as software update uh, Rauk and Mender we we have tried that tried them all so that's nice and uh, you also have uh, at on the in Linux wiki I made Linux wiki a collection of talks about um, firmware updates like how to fla reflash your devices so well that's it um, so let's uh, we have a uh, like 10 minutes for for discussions for feedback like if you have uh, answers to some of the questions I'm asking myself that's my email address you can find me on uh, Fastodon I don't have enough on Mastodon I don't have enough followers yet so if you have a Mastodon account and you're interested uh, you're welcome and um, the slides are available um, at this URL uh, both a PDF and the sources if you want to to reuse the sources uh, for yourself for, for presentations they are available uh, in LaTeX format and under a free documentation license thank you